Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Stem, Deputy Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, in, at the Department of Education. And I'm pleased to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Most of you on this webinar have heard about the Department's efforts to establish the Future Ready PA Index. And our goal today is to share some additional insights on our progress to date. Uh, we're going to begin with talking about the purpose of the Future Ready PA Index. Then we'll discuss context and background, uh, including uh, somewhat of a detailed timeline that we'll walk through at the beginning. Then talking about the building blocks of the Future Ready PA Index with some uh, highlights, uh, uh, some highlights of what we're endeavoring to accomplish. And then really where we'll spend the majority of our time is discussing uh, some of the proposed indicators uh, at detail. Uh, you know, what are the definitions and, and what are we considering in that process? And finally, we'll, we'll highlight our next steps moving forward. So as you'll hear more about on the upcoming slides, this work really began with a guiding vision. Uh, and that was to establish a system of school performance measures that moves beyond point in time achievement and values schools efforts to help all students learn, grow, and succeed in the classroom and beyond. A focus on multiple pathways to college and career readiness has been an underlying theme in all of our conversations. And so from a process standpoint, uh, looking at where we're at today, the development of indicators was really the second step to follow the establishment of our guiding vision. And please be aware that the work around methodology is ongoing as we explore the most effective calculations and reporting systems uh, to, be a part of, uh, to be a part of the Future Ready PA Index. That methodology will be a part of future communications uh, as we look to the weeks and months ahead. Before we dive into the indicators we're, that we're considering as part of the proposed Future Ready PA Index, we want to take a few minutes to step back and consider some historical context for this work. Pennsylvania's current tool for reporting school performance, the PA School Performance Profile, or SPP, was launched in 2013 to fulfill requirements established under Act 82 of 2012. The indicators currently used in the SPP are established in statute and regulation, and they reflect most heavily on singular point-in-time measures. While the SPP was developed to fulfill Act 82's requirements to calculate building level scores that factor into educator evaluation, the SPP also provides information to parents, families, and other community members about school quality and has become the most visible source of information about how schools are performing. When Governor Wolf took office in 2015, he charged Secretary Rivera and the Department of Education with re-examining uh, our reporting system and exploring more valid, comprehensive, and meaningful measures of school performance. Uh, the department uh, began by holding more than 30 review sessions during the 2015-16 school year on possible revisions to the current SPP. 
In the process, we gathered input from more than a thousand diverse stakeholders from across Pennsylvania regarding the proposed indicators, formulas, and weighting. Several revisions uh, occurred throughout the process based on feedback that we received. And throughout these discussions with stakeholders, uh, there really was a consensus that emerged, and that was a strong desire for more holistic indicators to determine the efficacy of schools across the Commonwealth. While the department was at work refining proposed measures and seeking feedback from diverse stakeholders, uh, Congress passed the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, which replaced No Child Left Behind as the nation's prevailing education law. ESSA's emphasis on broader accountability measures and more tailored evidence-based school improvement strategies aligned with the types of measures that the department was contemplating uh, in the revisions to the existing SPP. The department launched phase one of its ESSA stakeholder engagement efforts in April of 2016. More than 250 stakeholders convened for a general information and feedback session, and four stakeholder work groups were charged with identifying opportunities and recommendations in four key areas. Accountability, which ties into our conversations today, as well as assessment, educator preparation, and educator evaluation. In August of 2016, the work groups concluded their work identifying framework recommendations that were documented and contextualized in a report compiled by a third-party research partner uh, at the American Institute of Research. This fall, PDE kicked off phase two of ESSA stakeholder engagement, hosting six events throughout the Commonwealth with more than 500 in attendance to date. The feedback, ideas, concerns, and insights shared with the department over the past 18 months informed the work, and in December, the Secretary announced this new proposed tool, the Future Ready PA Index, at the 2016 SAS Institute. The new name reflects a commitment to ensure the success of our next generation of citizens in Pennsylvania. So moving from the overarching goals to the strategy level, there are several things we're endeavoring to accomplish in this new tool. First, uh, we are looking to increase the emphasis on student growth measures, which should incentivize a focus on all learners and is less sensitive to demographic variables. So we've heard a lot from stakeholders uh, in our travels that, uh, that growth allows for, um, for all learners to have their, their uh, achievement over the course of a year uh, better communicated to the public. Also, we're looking to measure English language acquisition among ELL students, not simply performance on a test of grade level ELA standards. Third, we're looking to incentivize career awareness instruction beginning at the elementary level. We're also looking at addressing the issue of unequal weighting of content areas uh, in the current SPP. So in the current SPP, English language arts is weighted twice uh, what math and science are weighted. And that's one of the issues and one of our goals in this system is to address that unequal weighting of content areas. We're looking to provide indicators of student success after graduation. And so we've, we've heard loud and clear from parents, from business owners, from community members, from elected officials that a school's job is not, uh, is not done on the day that a student walks across the stage with a diploma but the true reflection of a school's success in many ways is what a student is doing uh, and accomplishing after they graduate high school. And we're looking to increase the emphasis uh, along those lines on student access to course offerings that prepare them for that post-secondary success. And that includes AP, IB, college credit bearing courses such as dual enrollment, and also really emphasizing CTE programs of study as a, a significant and important pathway for our students. We're also looking uh, to provide additional snapshots of student success uh, academically beyond just the PSSAs. And so we're looking to include locally selected reading assessments and locally selected math assessments as additional snapshots of student progress. And we'll certainly talk about that shortly. We want to incentivize schools to offer career pathways that culminate with high-value, industry-recognized credentials. So, so many of our high schools, not, not just CTEs, uh, but traditional high schools, 
are offering industry recognized credentials in things such as uh, encoding, uh, Microsoft certifications, Java programming, C++, the like, uh, among others. And, and th that's work that we believe should be recognized and, and we would like to see those sorts of activities increase uh, among our high schools. And additionally, we want to recognize schools for decreasing the percent of students scoring at the below basic level. And, and uh, we know that we have schools that are moving students out of that bottom quartile, and it's important to communicate that out to the public so that they're aware of the progress being made by, by all students. There are three sections in the proposed design uh, of the Future Ready PA Index. Uh, the, first is a section, the first section is state assessment measures. The second is on-track measures, and the third is college and career, ready, uh, college and career readiness measures. We'll take a closer look at the proposed indicators beginning with state assessment measures. They are uh, the percent proficient and advanced, uh, excuse me, proficient or advanced on PSSAs and Keystone exams. Uh, the percentage of students meeting annual academic growth expectations as reflected through PVAS. Uh, and a look at students with disabilities meeting annual academic growth expectations. For each of these indicators, we're going to address definitions, and for some, we'll discuss additional considerations, particularly signaling um, those indicators that are going to, um, to require some new uh, calculations. So beginning with percent proficient or advanced on PSSAs and Keystone exams, the inclusion of this indicator is not a change and reflects the importance of demonstrating grade level proficiency. So we're still looking at uh, all students that are sco scoring proficient or advanced on each of the PSSA and Keystone exams. Uh, we would still be including all students who take the PSSA uh, or Keystone exams or the PASA and were enrolled for a full academic year, uh, the PSSA would still apply to students in grades 3 through 8, and Keystone exam scores would continue to reflect students' best score to date for all 11th grade students enrolled in the school for the full academic year. Um, and as a reminder, going back just one bullet, the, the PSSA exam in grades 3 through 8, uh, this is now going to be the third year of the new PSSA exam, which we put in place in 2015, and is certainly uh, more rigorous than the prior PSSA uh, as it's aligned to our PA core standards. Meeting annual academic growth expectations, the PVAS measure, represents the academic growth of the group of students taking the state assessments uh, as measured by the change in their overall achievement during the reporting year. And as a reminder, um, an academic progress measure is required as part of ESSA accountability rules, and this would be a measure that could satisfy that, uh, that academic progress requirement. Additionally, uh, significant stakeholder feedback, as I mentioned before, has reflected that this is a high priority for emphasizing uh, student growth in our system, and the majority of our stakeholders from, from all uh, sectors uh, have reported that this is a more meaningful measure than, than just purely the percentage of students proficient or advanced engaging the success of their schools in moving student learning. And we've added a couple of other slides here to, to answer some questions that have come up specifically around the new PSSA exam that we were just discussing. And one of the questions that we've received is, many times is around the correlation of poverty and PVAS scores, uh, and particularly as they, the correlation relates to the new PSSA. So what you have on your screen in front of you is a scatter plot of the 2016 math scores across all grade levels. And each of those dots uh, represents the percentage of students that were economically disadvantaged in, uh, in these schools. And so the x-axis uh, represents poverty levels from 0 to 100 and then the y-axis represents the growth index scores. And what you'll see here is uh, a relatively flat distribution of scores uh, in math uh, relative, to, relative to the percentage of students that are economically disadvantaged. In 
the chart that you have in front of you now uh, is English Language Arts PSSA, and again, this is all grades three through eight, and you'll see that this distribution is much the same uh, as it was on the uh, on the other, in, as we'd seen in math. So, so the distribution is relatively flat. Uh, regardless of poverty levels uh, at the school level. As a side note, while you're looking at the uh, grades three through eight English language arts, we are aware that the distributions on PSSA science as well as on the Keystone exams is not as evenly distributed uh, as they are on PSSA in English language arts and math, though these correlations now over a number of years have consistently uh, flattened over time. The students with disabilities meeting annual academic growth expectations uh, is a new indicator uh, for, and this represents the academic growth of the group of students taking the state assessments as measured by the change in their overall achievement during the reporting year. And this has been in, this indicator has been revised over time, and so there's, there's always been a focus on how do we ensure that students with disabilities are making appropriate progress in school, and this is probably the third iteration of what that indicator could look like. And um, so as, you know, as we move forward, this ensures that schools are focusing on, on all learners and that our students with IEPs are making progress commensurate with their, with their peers. The next section of the Future Ready Index uh, is our, our, our on-track measures. And they include a grade three reading indicator of success, a grade seven mathematics indicator of success, English language proficiency, attendance, and closing the achievement gap. The percentage of students meeting uh, the indicators of success on a locally selected assessment in grade three reading allows for schools to report a snapshot of academic progress in addition to the PSSA score. And from, from the department's level, we would not anticipate that this would be a new assessment for schools. In fact, it shouldn't be a new assessment for schools, but we're recognizing the fact that almost universally uh, our, our elementary schools are engaging in uh, other assessments of reading progress and that those assessments are providing meaningful information to teachers and schools regarding student progress and we believe that those are indicators that uh, it would be ve very valuable to also share those with the public in our system. So this would represent the percentage of students who demonstrate on-track performance measured via locally selected assessment providing an additional data point as we mentioned includes all students who take the locally ass selected assessment and were enrolled for a full academic year and this would be discretionary at the LEA level to determine whether or not to report this measure. So in operationalizing this indicator we know that PDE must define criteria by which LEAs can ensure that the locally selected assessments measure a student's pathway on the track to success. We also must facilitate trainings to the field to ensure understanding of the criteria and the appropriate ways to evaluate a locally selected assessment for this purpose. Along the same lines, um, we're proposing that there be a measure of student success uh, on another locally selected assessment in grade seven math. And grade seven math is, is one of those uh, key transition points for students where this, this really is a time to ensure that they have the conceptual math skills uh, as well as the computational math skills to engage in the higher level math courses that will follow in high school. And that, that explains the targeting of grade seven. And all the other descriptors uh, are the same as we described with the grade three English language arts meaning that it would be a locally selected assessment and LEAs would determine whether or not to report this measure. Now we do know that um, this is an area that uh, is not as universally um, operational as grade three English language arts. In other words, there are a number of schools that don't have uh, assessments that they're currently giving for additional snapshots on math for at the, at 
whether it's the seventh grade level or just the, 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 the middle years in general. Uh, but we do believe that this is a practice um, that uh, results in uh, increased uh, um, precision around how we're setting up instructional programs for students. And if a school is engaging in assessing student progress at the seventh grade level using an alternate assessment, uh, this is another area that we think should be communicated to stakeholders around uh, those snapshots of achievement. The English language proficiency indicator is another indicator that is required under ESSA. It's one of the five required indicators under ESSA is a measure of English language acquisition. And this is another area in which we in Pennsylvania were ahead of the curve in exploring. We, our, our teams uh, and, and uh, stakeholder groups had been uh, looking into this measure many, many months before ESSA had materialized. And what we're looking at here is really the percentage of students who are enrolled for a full academic year and are on track to English language proficiency. And we would be using the access test measures, which are currently available for all identified English language learners. So again, we're not talking about a new assessment. And in fact, um, one of the things that we didn't mention or one of the beliefs that, we, that undergirds our work is uh, the Future Ready PA Index uh, is, should not be a place where we're introducing new statewide assessments. That's, that's not the purpose and, and, we, uh, and it's not a belief that drives our development. And so the access is an assessment already taken by English language learners and uh, while specific calculations are still being explored for how we would translate access scores into a measure, this indicator really recognizes the importance of not just holding English language learners to grade level uh, expectations and standards, but really, more importantly, to the development of their English language skills based on when they entered a school or when, you know, when they entered the country. Given the body of evidence on school attendance and its correlation with achievement, attendance remains a critically important indicator. And there are two definitions we're reviewing that are going to impact our eventual methodology and calculations. Uh, the first is very similar uh, or really identical to the way we currently measure attendance on the, um, on the school performance profile, and that is essentially average daily membership. So the, the um, value represented for the reported year is the number of aggregate days of student attendance divided by the aggregate days school was in session for those students. And from a reporting standpoint, this is always a trailing indicator uh, based on the availability of data. So it's always would be reporting the prior year's data. The alternate definition under consideration is chronic absenteeism. And this is a, a, a definition and a different way of looking at attendance that may better satisfy federal accountability requirements. So in chronic absenteeism, it's typically measured as the percentage of students missing a certain number of school days, uh, regardless of the reason, and can be calculated as the percentage of students missing a defined percentage of school days or a defined number of school days. All of that would be, would be determined. While we are considering uh, both of these definitions, and in particular the second, we know that there would have to be controls for things like extended illnesses uh, and other excused absences that extend over a period of time. Uh, so we're, we're capturing the accurate data for students at risk for the appropriate reporting reasons. Closing the achievement gap uh, is actually two indicators that we have reflected on one slide here. Uh, both will be using the same uh, formula in some capacity. One indicator represents closing the achievement gap for all students, and then the second indicator represents the historically underperforming student group, which includes not only English language learners, economically disadvantaged students, and students with disabilities, but also uh, racial groups uh, as part of that subgroup disaggregation. And closing the achievement gap in simple terms would be looking at growth in overall proficiency over an established number of years. Now, this is another one of those indicators that um, although 
on, at face value is very similar or would appear to be the same as the closing the achievement gap measure in the current school performance profile. One of the things that, that we know needs to be considered in the methodology around this indicator is how we control for the sensitivity of small targets, particularly among high proficiency schools. In other words, right now in our current SPP, if a school has 95% of students that are proficient or advanced in a given year, the way we're currently calculating closing the achievement gap um, makes it very difficult for those schools to, to get any points um, or it becomes sort of an all or nothing indicator because the gap is so small. And that's whether that gap is for the all group or for the historically underperforming student group. So, so we, would, uh, we are contemplating ways that this can be calculated that control for that and, do not, and does not penalize schools that have proficiencies that, that are already uh, well above 90% uh, in a given content area. The third category on the Future Ready PA Index is college and career measures and includes a career standards benchmark, uh, ind industry standards based competency assessments or industry recognized credentials, APIB college courses, career pathways, graduation rate, and, uh, and an indicator around post-secondary transition to school, military, or work. The career standards benchmark is a new indicator and this is one you know if there was any indicator that we received an overwhelmingly an overwhelming and consistent uh, amount of positive feedback it's been around the career standards benchmark and uh, you know Pennsylvania is a state that does have an established set of standards known as the career education and work standards and these are skills such as collaboration communication teamwork time management uh, problem solving, time, and, and also uh, specific activities such as creating resumes, writing letters to employers. So we have the standards in place in Pennsylvania, but nowhere have we ever measured or reported on them in any kind of a public way. And as such, um, it, it can be a disincentive for schools to invest their resources in, this, in these critically important standards, which particularly our business and industry partners have communicated to us are lacking in many of our current high school graduates. And so this indicator would reflect uh, the school's efforts in these areas. And many of our schools are doing great work in this space, and many of our schools still have um, a great deal of work to do to build capacity in these areas. But at a surface level, we'd be looking at for the percentage of grade five students who demonstrate the acquisition of skills related to the career education and work standards through engagement in career exploration and preparation activities. Then at grade eight, we'd be looking at students who create individualized career plans. And finally, by, uh, by grade 11, students who complete career portfolios uh, during that reporting year. However we operationalize this, we know that this is going to require an efficient process for demonstrating evidence at each of these three levels. Remember the, the statement that I had shared before that the department um, as, a, as a core belief does not uh, propose that we introduce new assessments to measure these skills. We could certainly do that and there are assessments out there that can measure some of this work, but really what we want to do is be able to operationalize a process, an efficient process for schools to demonstrate the evidence that can be reported out and we, we also um, want to ensure that anything that we do relative to this indicator should be aligned to any potential changes in graduation requirements um, that could be forthcoming in, in the months ahead. The indicator of advanced placement, IB, college course offerings, and, and career pathways really is, a, is an indicator that acknowledges uh, the importance of course offerings aligned to college and career success and in ensuring that students are matriculating into those programs. Now, the methodology around this indicator will likely be uh, more complex than, than some of the other indicators, if not most of the other indicators, 
because there's several different factors that we would want to consider in this measure. So the first being just an input me measure of course offerings and, and the percentage of APIB or college course uh, offerings, co college credit bearing that a school offers. So that's one input. The others are reflections of either the percentage of students enrolled in those courses or even the percentage increase in students enrolled compared to the prior year. So, so we, we want to be have a, have a system that's sensitive to there may be a district that doesn't add new AP courses but is able to significantly increase the number of students that are, that are taking the courses that are being offered. And, and so in methodology, we've got, to, we've got to account for that. And then finally, uh, and, and very important, is looking at the percentage of students enrolled in a career and technical education uh, program, areas of concentration, who complete all of their secondary level competencies identified as part of approved CTE programs. We, we uh, acknowledge and recognize that we do not have enough students in Pennsylvania that are matriculating into our CTC programs which are, are having very high levels of either job placement uh, or post-secondary uh, pathways in, in reality that are coming from our CTC programs. And this is a place to recognize schools and districts that are uh, ensuring that they're having the right conversations with students to direct them into the uh, pathways that best meet their interests and, and aptitudes. The graduation rate calculation or the graduation rate indicator uh, is much the same as in the current school performance profile representing the percentage of students who graduate. Uh, here we're looking at six or fewer years as opposed to the current formulas which uh, look at the four-year cohort graduation. And the, the reason for looking at it this way is that we have a, a number of students in our schools uh, who are extending beyond four years in their high school program and, and many of whom, for example, are students with IEPs who are entitled vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their IEP to attend school until the age of 21. And those students are currently not captured in our graduation uh, reporting. And we believe that every student matters and that every student and school should be recognized when a student graduates, whether it's four years, five years, or six years. So uh, that, that's one thing of which to be aware here. And then obviously the graduation rate is, is only as meaningful as the graduation uh, requirements that we have in place. And uh, so PDE really looks forward to collaborating with the General Assembly on that good work and, and hope, we hope to have those opportunities uh, again in the weeks and months ahead. And finally, the last, the last indicator is the post-secondary transition to school, military, or work. And this is another uh, indicator that's partially reflected in ESSA reporting requirements, as well as some recent changes in IDEA regulations. Um, but more importantly, this reflects uh, belief systems uh, that amongst uh, not only the department and, and our partners here in Harrisburg, but among parents, business, and industry members in our communities that really believe that our role, our work as a school is not to simply get students to graduate, but to ensure that their skills are reflected in what it is they do after they graduate. And so we'd be looking in this one indicator uh, of numbers and percentages of students who have either enrolled in an institute of higher education within 16 months of receiving a diploma, uh, enlisted in the military within 16 months of receiving their high school diploma, or entering the workforce in Pennsylvania within 16 months of receiving their, their diploma. And this, this is another area that would require access to various data sets and, uh, and that's work that is ongoing for us. Some of these data sets are easier than others to, um, to, to be able to utilize with a, with a, a reliable um, correlation. So that work is ongoing as we explore that. And, and obviously, this is an indicator that may not be applicable for all purposes, such as whether, whether it be Act 82 or federal accountability purposes. So as we look at next steps, there, there are several, uh, several items to signal. 
uh, one being, and, and this is this is we want to make sure that we appropriately highlight this. On November 28th, the uh, USDE promulgated the final ESA accountability regulations. And there were some substantive changes in those final regulations versus the draft regulations that had been communicated for many, many months. One of the most significant is, is around methodology. And many states are now moving toward a dashboard approach uh, to, to reporting uh, instead of a single summative score. Now, to date, our work around these indicators uh, has been uh, with the notion of a summative score continuing to be reported. But we will continue to do our due diligence around exploring a dashboard approach as an option, given, given national trends and, and aligning some of those with our core values and beliefs. The other, um, the other item of note, one of the other items of note is possible revisions to proposed indicators. And so as we continue to engage our stakeholders and, and collaborate with our partners, we certainly won't rule out any uh, revisions to the indicators themselves. So the indicators that we've discussed, uh, there still could be further revisions as we continue our stakeholder input and collaboration, but we were comfortable being this far down the road in at least signaling where the indicators stand at this time. And, and third, the, this notion around subgroup calculations, uh, you know, one of the strongest requirements of ESSA is that every indicator that's used for federal accountability purposes uh, needs to be disaggregated by subgroup. And so, uh, so right now we are contemplating in our methodology how we would account for subgroup disaggregation for each of the indicators that we just discussed and, and what implications that would have uh, on our calculations and, uh, and reporting methodology. We also are continuing our stakeholder engagement. As mentioned before, we're in phase two of getting around the state. Um, we've, our team has been in Pittsburgh, Erie, Lock Haven, Philadelphia, uh, up in northern Bucks County, and I think we're still on our way to, to Scranton. And, uh, and then also we have other target groups that we're still continuing to work with, including uh, parents, students, uh, and, and others, and certainly continuing to collaborate very closely with the General Assembly. And so that engagement is going to continue. Uh, we, do a, we will be submitting our ESSA plan in September, uh, and our goal is to launch the Future Ready PA Index in the fall of 2018 using the 2017-18 data sets. So we believe that when we're successful in this endeavor, we'll have established a system that incentivizes student-centered practices that fully prepare them for success after graduation. And uh, we're thrilled at, at this opportunity uh, that we have and look forward to continuing to partner as we move forward. On this last slide, there is an email address to which any questions or suggestions can be sent. Uh, we've carved out a new address specifically for the Future Ready PA Index, so I know things can, can get a little complicated because of the overlap with ESSA, and we have a separate email for ESSA. But this email address can be shared uh, with any uh, stakeholders who have specific questions, suggestions, or thoughts regarding the Future Ready Index and, and how we're moving forward. So again, I thank everyone for, for making the time in, in busy schedules to be a part of today's webinar. And we look forward to staying uh, in close communications in the weeks ahead as we get more precise around uh, landing on final indicators and the associated calculations and methodology. So thank you for your time and have a wonderful afternoon.